one of the most important aspects, I think, of computerized decision support and health IT is it's an ability to provide systems that reduce the likelihood of medical error and, and bad drug interactions and things like that. One of the problems with using health IT to incentivize or to push people towards cost-effective care in general is we as a, as a society have not yet embraced that as a principle. The ACA specifically forbids the use of costs and other things like that in the decisions about what to do and what not to do and things like that. So um, although health IT could be used, like many tools, to do things like that, it, that's not an, an activity that has been embraced yet by this society. There are real challenges in, in really bringing evidence to bear, uh, knowing the right kind of patient, the right kind of context, understanding the other forces that have an impact on the way in which clinicians make decisions, uh, and because it's not always based on evidence, and we know that, and sometimes that's a problem, but sometimes it actually makes sense. I think we got that sense of how important this was from another industry by looking at, at the airline industry and uh, uh, that miracle on the Hudson with uh, Captain Sullenberger's uh, discussion of how there were no rules to be followed at the time that that incident occurred and uh, the expertise had to take over and we know there are situations like that in healthcare as well. Even with the amount of evidence that we were producing, we have examples just like the airline example where the evidence is simply too blunt to answer all the questions that we need to answer. So it gets complicated to know how to instantiate evidence into clinical decision support tools in a way that is usable, believable, and will provide the answer correctly most of the time. Part of that comes from how the evidence gets into the what we know and feel is true in the world. And we saw that from the editor of JAMA, who told us about a lot about one of the most prominent medical journals in the world and how it views its responsibility in the production of research reports that provide the evidence base for the de decision support that we create. And that was really an important and useful um, viewpoint about what their view of what their role in the production of the knowledge base and evidence base for the decisions we make are. One of the sessions that I thought was particularly important for this kind of audience to understand was the presentations about the psychology of decision making and how doctors make decisions, how clinicians make decisions, how patients make decisions. If you don't understand that, it's the decision support systems that you develop won't be anywhere near as successful as they will be if you create decision support systems that understand the sort of psychological dynamic of how clinicians and others who use information systems think about the world and how their workflow works. And so I think that notion that we can't just be technical doobies who go around building little apps that do something that's really cool, although that's good stuff, we have to keep constantly in mind how those particular applications how the format of them, the structure of them, what they're trying to do presents data to clinicians and how that interacts with the way fundamentally in their psychology of how they make decisions, how that interacts with that. Many of the, the regulatory elements that are coming out now in meaningful use or the standards development are affecting all institutions, not just the academic institutions. So uh, to the extent that the community hospitals are themselves uh, seeking to get full payments for their meaningful use compliance in their EHR investments, uh, much of what was said today was just as relevant in, in the community hospitals. They have to be dealing appropriately with the vendors they work with. They have to try to make sure that these features are there. They have to make sure they're certified to be compliant with meaningful use requirements. Uh, and even the private practitioners, and we're not just talking about community hospitals, but the systems that are used in small practices or multi-specialty groups, uh, again, uh, require attention to the very same details that may have emerged out of academia, but now are part of federal regulations uh, and have an impact on the incentive payments under ARRA. Some of the principles that they have learned in large academic medical centers about the use of clinical decision support to integrate it directly into the workflow of the clinicians who are using it, that it has to be based on um, evidence that is believable with local experts. It has to, there's a whole set of principles 
that are true probably anywhere. And that I think that knowledge will allow even community hospitals and the um, people who need to assure that their own individual institution is up to all the standards of meaningful use and, uh, and those sorts of rules and regulations, adhering to those principles will be a good thing whether you're a large academic medical center or a small community hospital. In particular, I think that the uh, strategic issues that were being discussed are something that need to be understood in the, in the very top C-suite offices. So for CEOs and CMOs, to really understand the strategic role of IT in delivering high quality care and support for excellent decision making, understand some of the liabilities associated with inappropriate use or with failing to use such tools uh, is really relevant for essentially anyone who's managing large healthcare systems and hospitals. And so I, it's really, I think, uh, aimed as much at the, as, uh, the senior leaders uh, as it is uh, to practitioners. The other group that I think could be benefit from understanding this more because they have the fiduciary th responsibility and authority for structuring hospital and health system budgets are board members. And so that most, most of these organizations, if you're a nonprofit organization or if you're a profit organization, you're governed by a board that is actually responsible for many budgetary allocations and, and how much we're spending on IT and how much we're spending on, on other kinds of investment and how much we're spending on bricks and mortars and et cetera. And also most um, safety and patient safety and quality improvement uh, activities do go up through board approval and have board uh, oversight. And so I think that the members of quality and safety committees, of finance committees on boards that uh, govern hospitals and health systems and other healthcare organizations would benefit substantially for understanding the incredible importance both regulatorily and just for maintaining patient safety. We have major problems with our healthcare system that have to be addressed in a variety of other ways. But HIT is a key enabler. You heard one talk today that said transcription errors were reduced 100% after the introduction of HIT. Well, if you can totally eliminate a certain kind of error, which is responsible for major problems. And there are many examples of transcription errors leading to inappropriate dosing or actually the agent that's given to patients because of bad handwriting and things like that. Those kind of errors just are inexcusable now. Uh, and, and in the paper-based world, they were common. And today, we, we can eliminate them. Well, that has an impact on error, on, on cost, and certainly on patient well-being. So, uh, when we can, we use HIT to, uh, to address those issues that are clearly fixable by HIT. And we try to help a changing system with HIT because as the system changes, HIT can adapt and help in many ways promote the process re-engineering that's going on, for example, uh, in many healthcare settings as people really think differently about how they carry out routine activities in order to make them more efficient and more safe. Mm -hmm.